The Book of Esther. This is a good book. My, my, so much application in the Book of Esther. Did you know not one time God's name is mentioned in Esther? Not one prayer offered to God in the Book of Esther. But we can just see God all over it. Amen? In the Book of Esther. Now, it's been several weeks. We did go through chapter 1, but let me give you just a little bit of review in Esther chapter number 1. We asked a question a few weeks ago, can and will God direct a people who has forgotten and rejected Him? Well, I know He can, and it's called providence. Providentially, and uh, every one of us, I believe, can stand up tonight and say, providentially, God led me here. Led me to the point to where I heard the gospel, a clear presentation of the gospel, trusted Christ as my Savior, and now I'm serving Christ. So that's the providence of God. And, and we had a definition for the sake of the book of Esther, a definition of providence, is God leading a people who was not willing to be led. God leading, God led us in situations and circumstances to bring us where we are now. Hold your place in Esther. And... Um, Go over here to Psalm 137. You remember this verse? I used it here a few weeks ago. Psalm 137. We're going to go back to Esther here just in a moment. But Psalm 137. And verse number 4. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. If I do not remember thee, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth, if I prefer not Jerusalem above my chief joy. Now, I can make an application with those verses today. If I prefer not the house of the Lord as my chief joy, if I prefer, if I prefer something else besides the house of the Lord and living for Christ, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. I preached a message one time using this text on spiritual lock jaws. And of course, I went in a direction. It's hard to preach against a bulldog when one's got a hold of your leg. If you're involved in sin, my dear friend, it's hard to talk about Jesus. But we need to make sure that we keep under our body as a child of God, bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when we preach to others, that we ourselves should become a castaway. Well, right here in the book of Esther, we have a whole lot of people, millions of people, still in the land of Media Persia and Babylon who had an opportunity to go home. And you remember what the psalmist said, let my tongue cleave the roof of my mouth if I prefer not Jerusalem above my chief joy. So what we're looking at here is a lot of people, a lot of Jewish people in the land of Media Persia in the book of Esther had spiritual lockjaw. They were out of the will of God. Yet God was leading. Providentially, God was leading them. Now, after, uh, again, I said they had an opportunity to go home. After 70 years of Babylonian captivity, Cyrus made a decree that all the Jews could return to their land. And according to uh, Ezra and Nehemiah, Haggai, and Zechariah, less than 60,000 Jews returned back to the promised land. A lot were still away. Now, the rest of them stayed the foreign land out of the will of God. Uh, when I say that, I remember the book of Ruth. And I'm sure you're familiar with the book of Ruth. You remember Naomi and Elimelech? When he uh, actually left Bethlehem, Judah, and went down into Moab. You know what always puzzled me? How in the world? I realized there was a famine in the land. But why in the world would anyone want to leave the house of bread and bread and go to the pig pen? Do you know what God said about Moab in the book of Psalm? He said it was his wash pot. That simply means that it's his garbage can. Why in the world would anybody that experienced the goodness of God, had fellowship with God and his people, why would they want to leave and go back out in the world? I don't know why, but they do. Elimelech did it, Naomi did it. They stayed longer than they needed to stay. It cost them more, of course than they wanted to pay. Well, here's a group of Jews that cost them more than they wanted to pay as well. 
Why? Because they did not prefer Jerusalem above their chief joy, and their tongue did cleave to the roof of their mouth. Now, well, that's what we're looking at uh, here in, in uh, the book of Esther. Now we get to chapter number 1, and we're looking here in verse number 1, the Bible says, It came to pass in the days of Ahasuerus. Now Ahasuerus, we said a few weeks ago, is a title. This is actually King Xerxes. Uh, Ahasuerus is a title, like Pharaoh. But uh, according to uh, Isaiah chapter 44, verse 28, and I'm not going to go there, chapter number 45, verse number 1, this is the Ahasuerus and Esther that were parents of the Cyrus of Isaiah. Now what we're looking at then in verse number 2 and through verse number 8 of chapter number 1 is a million dollar banquet. And this banquet, this party, lasted for 180 days according to verse number 4, which is six months. Now. Ahasuerus was planning to take Greece and be the supreme world ruler and was showing the world that he could finance such a venture. Well, in verse number 7, it was a very pagan banquet from beginning to the end, and it ended in a drunken orgy. And then verse number 8, the Bible said, and the drinking was according to the law, none did compel and so on and so forth. Well, it's the same way today as we make application. Major decisions are made over cocktails. You'd think that the president on down, the businessmen and corporate leaders, would want sober executives, wouldn't you? You'd think they would, to make intelligent decisions. But nevertheless, that was what was going on here at this pagan banquet. Now, how could God visit such a pagan scene as this. Even according to verse number 9, Vashti, the queen, was heading up the women's club. Now, in verse number 10, 11, and 12, and I'm going quickly in chapter 1 because we've already preached through it. But in verse number 10, 11, and 12 of chapter number 1, we see a request of a drunken king. Vashti evidently was a very beautiful woman, and the king wanted to show her off. He sent for her, and she was so embarrassed and she felt this she, she didn't come. Uh, sometimes, and of course she refused, then they had a then they had a meeting of the cabinet in verse number 13, 14, and 15. And no one had ever rejected the king. And so there was a fellow named and I, and I looked up his name so I could pronounce this right. Uh, verse number 16, 17, and 18, his name, Memucan. I've always called him Memucan. Memucan. Nevertheless, you try to pronounce that media Persian name, brother. All right, now, nevertheless, that's what it said in the Strongs anyway. Now, in this cabinet meeting, in this cabinet meeting, and, 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 and fellas, I'm not making light, I'm just preaching what... What, what happened here? The queen didn't show up, and so this fellow, whatever his name is, however you want to pronounce it, he became in the kind. He uh, he was the spokesman, not only the spokesman, but he was the hen pecked husband. You see, if the queen gets away with this, then this fellow wouldn't want to go home. Because it would go all over the land that the queen defied the king and therefore the women would be on the uprise and try to rule the husband. Now read it yourself. There it is. I'm not, I'm not manufacturing this. Amen. Alright, so nevertheless, the king, of course, ended up banishing his queen Vashti. You know what I found? And here's another application from this chapter. You better be careful what you say and what you do. Words can hurt. James said the tongue sits on the fires of hell. Your mother taught you when you were growing up. If you can't say anything good, then keep your mouth shut. Somebody's listening. You can't say anything good, just keep your mouth shut. 
Amen. and you'll be better off. Because you can't unsay what you've already said. Some of you said some very hurtful things to your children, some very hurtful things to your wives. Wives said some very hurtful things to your husband. You can't take them back. You can't unsay what you've already said. You certainly can't undo what you've already done. Now I realize this. As a child of God and as a preacher of righteousness, I realize that what I have said and what I have done is under the blood of Christ. And you better thank God every day it is instead of being held against you. But the best thing you can do is say I'm sorry, which a lot of people won't do. I don't know how many wives and husbands have sit in my office and one of the biggest gripes that both had is they say that they, and they'll point one to the other, they have never said they're sorry. I realize we can use that phrase so often that it becomes meaningless. But it might be that there's one here tonight that needs to look at the other and say, I really am sorry. I, I didn't mean to cause the hurt I caused and the trials and the pain that I've caused. I am sorry. And whatever I can do to make it right, I'm going to make it right. Christ has forgiven me 2,000 years ago on the cross of hell. But I want you to forgive me. I want you to forgive me. So that's a good lesson we learned. The king said some things that he could never take back. He made a decree according to the law of the media Persians that could never, ever be altered. If you'll notice there in verse number 19, if it please the king, let there go a royal commandment from him, and let it be written among the laws of the Persians and Medes, that it be not altered. Once a decree or a law was made and sealed with the king's ring, it could never never be reversed. You know, there's a, there's a good truth right here, a good, a good analogy we can make. Did you know the Bible said the soul that sinneth it shall die? Do you know the Bible said sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death? These aren't some silly aphorisms. These are laws of an eternal God who cannot lie. And it was sealed with the king's ring. It was sealed by the very Word of God. There's a penalty for sin. Christ paid your penalty. There is a law, my dear friend. The law will bring you to Christ if you'll let it. But you'll never come to Christ until you face the law. The law says guilty. Guilty. The law doesn't say maybe. The law says do. There's no loopholes in the law. And because of the law... Because of the force and the magnitude of the law, we see just how guilty we are. That we're unworthy. The law has brought us to that place in our lives where we understand that we're guilty and deserving of hell. Amen. And a person is going to get to that point before he ever seeks Christ. Before he ever comes to Christ or accepts Christ. You're just going to see how lost you really are. Well, anyway, the law was made, sealed with the king's ring, and it could never be altered. All right, we get to chapter 2. To chapter 2. After these things. After what things? The things of chapter number 1. After the campaign against Greece, where Ahasuerus was, by the way, soundly defeated. Alexander was on the rise, the Grecian Empire was on the rise. After these things, after his defeat, he returned to his place, his palace, in deep dejection, and added to his misery was the absence of his queen, Vashti. Even the king could not overturn a law of the Medes and Persians. Vashti could never, ever be his queen again. Again, in application, how often do we make hasty decisions under the influence of the world and wish 
over and over again that we have not made those decisions. God help us to seek out and to search, not be very, not be too quick to answer. Let's seek the will of God. Amen. So after these things, chapter 2, verse 1, when the wrath of King Ahasuerus was appeased, he remembered Vashti and what she had done and what was decreed against her. Then said the king's servants that ministered unto him, Let there be fair young virgins sought for the king, and let the king appoint officers in all the provinces of his kingdom, that they may gather together all the fair young virgins unto Shushan the palace, to the house of the women, and to the custody of Hege, the king's chamberlain, keeper, uh, keeper of the women, and let their things for purification be given them. And let the maiden which pleaseth the king be queen instead of Vashti. And the thing pleased the king, and he did so. Now in Shushan the palace there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jair, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, of Benjamin, who had been carried away from Jerusalem in the captivity, which had been carried away with Jeconiah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away. And he brought up Hadassah, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter, for she had neither father nor mother, and the maid was fair and beautiful, whom Mordecai, when her father and mother were dead, took for his own daughter. So it came to pass, when the king's commandment and his decree was heard, and when many maidens were gathered together under Shushan the palace to the custody of Hagai, that Esther was brought also to the king's house to the custody of Hagai, the keeper of the women. And the maiden pleased him, and she obtained kindness of him, and he speedily gave her things for purification, which such things, with such things as belonged to her, and seven maidens which were meet to be given, uh, given her, out of the king's house, and he and he preferred her and her maids unto the best place of the house of the women. Let me let me stop reading there in verse number nine. Now. After these things, we said after, of course, the Hasselus was sound and feet, going back to his palace in deep sorrow, realizing he couldn't have his queen back. Now, the servants knew his state of mind, so in verse number 2 and verse number 3, they suggested a beauty contest. And according to verse number 4, the, king's, the king, the Hasselus, was to be the judge. Now let me let me let me let me put something in right here. Don't use verse number two and three of Esther chapter two to say that God approves beauty contests. We've, we've got to remember that these people, the Jews, were out of the will of God. Yet God directs them by His providence. I'm going to say more about the beauty contest here just in a minute. No need, uh, there's no need to question what the Bible has to say. Amen. Now, Mordecai, we see, of course, the king, Ahasuerus, and his condition. And then we see Mordecai and his condition. Well, according to verse number 5 and 6, he was out of the will of God. He had an opportunity. How do I know that? Why do I say that? Because Mordecai had an opportunity to go back to the land where he belonged and he didn't do it. Now, Mordecai, out of the will of God, in verse number 5, Mordecai was from the tribe of Benjamin. And I keep wondering what in the world that he's doing there in the land of Media Persia. He belonged to the royal family of Israel. He was from the family of Saul. But verse number 6, of course, tells us how he got there. He was taken captive. Yet Cyrus, again, let me just emphasize, Cyrus had given a decree that the Jews could return to the land and those in the will of God did return. How can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? If I prefer not Jerusalem above my chief joy, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. A lot of people can't talk about Christ because they're so involved in things of the world. Well, Christ's name is not mentioned. God's name is not mentioned. Prayer is not mentioned in the book of Esther. I've, I've come to the conclusion that Mordecai is out of the will of God. They chose to stay behind because they liked this there. I wonder sometimes 
why people leave. And then again, the question enters our mind, what appeals to you? What do you like? What made you leave? What made people leave? Thank God some of you come back home. Amen. What made you leave? I'm, I'm reminded of a verse over in 2 Timothy chapter 4. And verse number 10 where it says, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica, Christians to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me, Paul said that. But I wonder why Demas, Demas, and I, I, I'm not preaching on Demas tonight, but according to the book of Philemon, and according to the book of Colossians, Demas stayed with Paul a long time. At least two years. By the writings of Philemon and Colossians. His name mentioned in those two books. I wonder what made him leave. The Bible said he went to Thessalonica. You know what I believe? Just what the Bible said. He loved this present world. He must have liked it there. He had been there on a missionary trip with Paul. He must have liked it there. In Thessalonica, they would elevate the lowest form of sin to the highest expression of worship. They would offer their bodies in the name of religion. Is what they would do. Demas must have liked it. I wonder what makes people happy when they leave the house of bread and pray. And they go to the far country and they wallow in the pig pen. Some come to their senses and see what they've missed at the Father's house. Some are still out there. My dear friend, learn a lesson from the Scripture. The grass is not greener on the other side. I promise you, there's nothing in the world but artificial turf. I've said that. It offers something that it doesn't have the power to perform or to produce. The world is offering you glitter and gold and it does not have it. Amen? The glitter and the gold and the peace and the contentment, and I'm not talking about physical gold, you know that, but the content and the peace is right here around the Word of God and around God's people. I love my church. I love the church. God ordained the church so we could come together and leave the, the thoughts of the world and leave the cares of the world outside just for a brief moment to rally around His Word and be fed and get some instruction to help us better serve Him the next day. You need to be in the house of God. Those that forsake the house of the God and say, I'm as good as Christian as anybody, no, you're not. If God has commanded you to not forsake the assembling of yourselves, you need to be here every time the doors are open, if at all possible. Amen? Right here in the house of God. Well, we see Mordecai's condition. Then we see Esther's condition in verse 7, 8, 9, and 10. Now, her Hebrew name was Hadassah, which means star. Her mom and dad had died, and she was raised by her first cousin, Mordecai. She had one great asset. She was very beautiful. She was very fair. The Bible makes it clear she must have been a very beautiful, beautiful woman. In verse number 8 and 9, she was entered into a beauty contest by her cousin Mordecai, who was a lot older, who raised her, the Bible said, as his daughter. At this point, I was reading after another preacher, at this point, I despise Mordecai, and I have no respect at all for the man Mordecai. But we've read the rest of the story. You see, what happened is taking this beautiful young virgin, Esther, and if she were to lose the beauty contest, she would have had to remain in that old king's harem as a concubine till she died. See, I don't have any respect for a man that would do that to his daughter. But see, I read the rest of the book. See how the Bible, this has to be the Word of God because it, if a good man wrote it, he would have left stuff like this out of it. 
And a bad man, of course, didn't write it. We understand that. It must be God. Amen? God wrote the Word of God. He gives all the information that we need. Now, what we're seeing, even though she was entered into the view, you read it for yourself. They went in and they were prepared. They would go in the evening into the king and wouldn't leave till the next morning. Well, that means that Hadassah would have been a concubine if she didn't win, or Esther would have been a concubine if she didn't win the beauty contest. Now, there's one thing about Esther. In verse number 10, the Bible says, Esther had not showed her people nor her kindred, for Mordecai had charged her that she should not show it. She was told to hide her nationality. She was told to deny her religion. I found that, again, when Christians are out of the will of God, they have very little to say about their faith in Christ. That's what I was talking about earlier. And I preach that sermon on it's hard to preach against a bulldog when one's got a hold of your leg. It's hard to talk about Christ when you're involved in sin. But people have just little to say about Christ. Well, let's go back to Mordecai. Back to Mordecai in verse number 11. And Mordecai walked every day before the court of the women's house to know how Esther did and what should become of her. See, when you're not in the will of God, it's hard to rest. You, you don't have to say amen out loud, but I think every one of you know what I'm talking about. When you know something's not right in your own life, you don't rest so easy. Just like David. When David went a whole year trying to bottle up inside his sin is recorded in the book of 1 Samuel chapter number 11. When he tried to bottle it up, the Bible said, speaking of himself, that his bones roared all the night long. He didn't get any sleep. I mean, popping Psalmonex right and left, couldn't get any sleep. Something just wasn't right in his life. Finally, God sent Nathan and told him that he was the man. You know what I believe David did? I believe David just threw his hands up and said, Thank God it's finally out. I can get a good night's rest tonight. It's finally out. I can go to sleep tonight. And of course we see David's prayer and his actions, and I'm not going to go there, in Psalm 51 if you're in there. Of course, God had mercy on David. Amen? So you can't rest when you're out of the will of God. Uh, but you can rest when you're in the will of God based on the based in, in light of Romans chapter 8, verse 28. All things work together for what? For good. For them that love God. For them that are called according to His purpose. When you're in the will of God, you, can, you don't have any problem resting. You don't have any problem. I'm not worried about what anybody says. Why? Because I know I'm clean. I, I know that. And I, and I believe that God is going to do my battle. He's going to do. He's going to. He's going to help me. He's the avenger. So just keep keep under your body. Keep it right. Keep it clean. Keep your thoughts clean. Let only the thing go in your mind, in your eyes, in your ears that are pleasing. Saturate your life with the Word of God and with prayer, and, and and that's why that I constantly preach as your pastor to be faithful to the house of God. Be faithful. Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. I realize that sickness comes in and I realize that some work schedules conflict. I understand that. But my dear friend, when you're sitting at home in front of the TV, but you can be here, shame on you. You're missing out. You're missing out on what God has for you. All right, now, we, we get now back to the theme of Esther is providence. And let me go just a little bit further here in chapter number 2. And uh, we'll wrap it up for this evening. We saw Ahasuerus, his condition, Mordecai, his condition. We saw Esther and her condition. We understand what providence is, God leading those, particularly here in the book of Esther, those that aren't willing to be led. In verse number 12, though, as 
Of course, Esther was entered into the beauty contest. They had to go through purification. And I want to help you ladies out tonight just a little bit, okay? Look at verse 12. Now, when every maid's turn was come to go into King Ahasuerus, after that she had been 12 months according to the manner of women, for so were the days of their purification accomplished to wit, six months with oil of myrrh and six months with sweet odors with other things for the purifying of the women. Now, fellas, you shouldn't gripe and complain anymore about your wife sitting in front of the makeup mirror getting her all self pretty you sitting there looking at your clock. These women took a year. <laughs> <laughs> they took a year, all right? So have a little patience with you once. <laughs> let her put on her makeup and her lipstick and let her all be pretty for you, amen. So uh, beauty, the beauty contest begins there in verse number uh, 13 through 17. It's time to start. And uh, the contestants would have anything they wanted in the line of clothes, jewelry, makeup, and so on. And this is why Mordecai, I believe, was biting his fingernails. Forever, if Esther lost, forever, a concubine of the old king. Well, it was Esther's turn in verse number 15 of uh, Esther chapter number 2. And it was decided that Esther was a natural beauty. Look at verse 15. Now when the turn of Esther, the daughter of Abigail, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her for his daughter, was come to go into the king, she required nothing but what Hagen, the king's chamberlain, the keeper of the women, appointed. And Esther obtained favor in the sight of all of them that looked upon her. Yeah, she's a clear winner. I mean, she's just a, she's a natural beauty. She goes in, the contest was over, Ahasuerus had found the queen. Now, out of all of these women that were brought before Ahasuerus, do you think it was by accident or just by chance that Esther picked the new queen? No, it was the providence of God. That's where I'm going to leave you tonight. If you're interested to know what's happening, go read the rest of the book. <laughs> and then next Wednesday, I'll be here to preach a little bit more to you. But providentially, God has led you to the place where you can be with God's people around God's Word. And when I say providentially, God has brought you here, let me, let me tell you tonight, if you're not saved, God Almighty loves you so much. Adam plunged you into sin. We have a sin nature, and by virtue of our sin, we deserve hell. But God loved you so much that He became a man. And he lived a sinless life on this earth, walked as a man on this earth. We inspected Him and found that He is indeed the Lamb of that land. Therefore, worthy to inspect the sins of mankind. God put Christ on the cross. You say the Romans did it. Oh yeah. Religion trumped up the charges and the Romans carried it out. But Jesus said they didn't have any power over him except God gave it to him. God put him on the cross. All of our sins, every last sin, every one of your sins, every one you ever have committed, are committing, and will commit, was placed on Christ. And God judged Christ for your sins. So he was satisfied. The payment was made. The payment of sin, the wages of sin is that Jesus died for your sin. Did you know that God is satisfied with the payment? Your sins have been paid for. Instead of begging God to do something with your sins, why don't you come tonight and just thank Him for doing something already? Yes, sir. 2,000 years ago, He did something with your sins. He died for your sins. He'll let you go to heaven because of Christ. Did you know that He loves His Son so much that He'll let any, any 
person. From Adam to the last man that he'll let anyone into heaven to talk about. You come to Christ as you are, a sinner realizing who you are, realizing that your debt's paid. Trusting and resting in the finished work of Christ. And you can go to heaven. Amen. Let's stand to our feet, please, if you will. And I'm going to ask Mr. King to come and just play, play through a song, just uh, maybe a stanza or two. And while she's playing, you reflect on what's been said. Providentially, did God lead you here tonight to let you know your sins are forgiven and paid for? You can trust Christ. Providentially, child of God, maybe you come out of the far country and you come back home. Maybe you just need to come tonight while the piano is playing. Just tell the Lord you saw. You say, I'm sorry. I didn't want to do that. I stayed longer than I needed to stay. I want to come back home. I want to be in your will tonight. I want to leave the Faith Baptist Church tonight knowing that I'm in the will of God. Father, thank you for the message. Bless it to all. In Jesus' name. Amen. This king plays you come.